Well, I'm glad you're here. My name's Josh. If we haven't met, I'm one of our pastors here at the bridge, and you're stuck with me today uh, as we continue our series through uh, the life of David. This is like part 300. I don't know. I've lost count. There's been a lot, but it's been great. I want to just recap where we've been the last few weeks. We've been in this kind of saga with David and Bathsheba. All right, David and Bathsheba, they commit adultery with one another, and then they try to cover it up, and David has Bathsheba's husband murdered, and so he's lying. He's covering this up. Around a year has passed. David and Bathsheba have had a baby, and now this prophet named Nathan has come. And that's what we talked about last week, and he confronts David on his sin. David repents and turns from his sin. The Lord forgives him. But then Nathan tells him some very, very hard things and some consequences of David's sin that he's going to have to walk through. And that's where we find ourselves today. And I just want to say right out of the gate that this is a tough sermon. It's a tough sermon for me personally to have to study and kind of walk through old pain. And I know for many of you who are walking through hard things, this might be a tough one for you. But I got some good news for you, there's a lot of hope in Jesus. And that's what we're gonna really talk about today. And so I wanna be really sensitive too to people in the room who are hurting, who are walking through a variety of things. And I want you to hear everything that I have to say in love. But we've gotta deal today with this complicated factor of the consequences of our sin as of our choices that we make and then the consequences of sin at a kind of a broader level as the fall, this broken world that we're living in. And we're gonna kind of walk through those things for the first part of this sermon. You know, this passage has affected me on a personal level um, because, I don't know, many of you know, some of you don't know, we lost a child about 11 years ago, uh, a stillborn, and the, some of the verses in this have been a lifeline for Allison and I as we've walked through that. And so... Uh, it's very tender to me, uh, but there's a couple of truths that we're going to get to, and it's just a little spoiler alert that helped us heal, and that's the hope of heaven and the presence of God, um, and that's available for all of you. So we're going to navigate through these things, the consequences of sin. I want to put a statement on the, on the screen that kind of just sets the tone for what we're kind of going to be talking about. It goes like this, all tragedy in this life is a consequence of sin but not all tragedy that happens to you is a consequence of your sin. Does it make sense? I'm gonna read it again. All tragedy in this life is a consequence of sin, meaning the fall, this broken world that we live in, but not all tragedy that has happened or will happen or is happening to you is a consequence of your own personal sin. I think that's important for us to understand. But there's one truth that's gonna help us navigate this all, and that is God is faithful. He is faithful. Even when we don't understand, he is faithful. All right? Here we go. Let's stand together. We're gonna to read this passage together. We're gonna to focus on 13 through 18 right now, 2 Samuel chapter 12. It'll be on the screen if you don't have your Bible or phone. And look, my prayer today ultimately is that God's gonna give you a little breath back in your lungs. If you're coming in here dry and weary, if you're walking through something hard, that you'll leave here feeling a little bit encouraged and a little bit of hope today, all right? Let's read this. Verse 13, David responded to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Then Nathan replied to David, and the Lord has taken away your sin. You will not die. Verse 14, however, because you treated the Lord with such contempt in this matter, the son born to you will die. Then Nathan went home. The Lord struck the baby that Uriah's wife had born to David, and he became deathly ill. David pleaded with God for the boy. He fasted, went home, and spent the night lying on the ground. The elders of his house stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he was unwilling and would not eat anything from, with them. Verse 18, on the seventh day, the baby died, but David's servants were afraid to tell him the baby was dead. They said, look, while the baby was alive, we spoke to him, and he wouldn't listen to us. So how can we tell him the baby is dead? 
he may do something desperate. Let's pray. Our sovereign Lord, we thank you for your love and your mercy for us. We thank you in the middle of the chaos, in the middle of the mess, you find us, you meet us, you are with us. And though some of the content today is, is difficult to navigate, Lord, we know that you are faithful and you are true and you are a light. And Holy Spirit, I ask you to come, not only fill me uh, as I teach your word, but you would be present in our midst and do things far beyond anything that I could do. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. All right, so let me set the scene here for us a little bit. We've got David. He's heard the snooze. His baby is sick. The baby has died, or he's going to die. And David is laying on the ground in absolute, desperate, he's devastated, and he's pleading with God to save the baby. And he's fasting and he's praying. The servants and elders of his house are there and they, they can't get him to really do anything. And it's just sad. Just sadness is there. Forget the consequences for a moment. This is just a sad situation that we're dealing with here. I don't know if you've ever been in a room where tragedy has happened like you were there when it happened or moments after it happened and it's just so thick. The sadness and the trauma are so thick that you can almost just feel it. Have you ever been there? Some of you are in similar situations, maybe where you are. You've been praying with, to God for a miracle, for something to happen, for the person to be healed or whatever it may be, and then it doesn't happen. The loved one passes away. The cancer doesn't get better. The marriage doesn't heal. And if you haven't been in these type of situations or experienced these type of things, you're, you're probably going to at some point. And let me tell you something. No matter how much you read or experience, there's no way to really prepare for these type moments. They're just hard. And I really uh, relate with, uh, it calls them the elders, the servants, or whoever they were. They don't know what to do. And they're just kind of like in limbo of like, God, we don't really know what David's gonna do. They're afraid to even interact with him because they don't know how he's gonna act. And this is just no simple thing for us to navigate through. And honestly, even for myself and my wife, with our own story with losing a child, it's taken us a lot of years to get to a place of kind of firm standing and to navigate through a lot of these things. I gotta mention this. He was my dear friend. Yesterday was the three-year anniversary uh, that my friend Josh Simmons uh, went to be with the Lord. He was in our worship team for over 10 years. He played electric guitar. He was one of my greatest friends, our resident rascal, and um, just an amazing person and an unbelievably gifted musician. He died of complications of COVID, and that just didn't make sense. We prayed and we pleaded and we asked God to, to heal him, to let him live, and then we had to walk through his death. And that just was hard. It didn't make sense. It was hard to navigate. It didn't make sense. It still doesn't make sense. But the other side of this coin, in context of this passage, we've got something else to deal with because David is, part of this is his consequences for his sin. And God's allowing him to walk through this as a consequence. Verse 14, however, because you treated the Lord with such contempt in this matter, the son born to you will die. I know some of you are walking through suffering right now because of the consequences of your sin, or maybe you know people who are, and you understand right where David is. I have several friends in this room and outside of this room who are recovering addicts, and God's just done amazing things in their lives of transformation and healing and restoration but they are still living in the consequences of their choices. And sometimes that's medical, sometimes that's family, broken relationships that take a long time 
to regain health there. Sometimes it's a lack of trust. When trust is broken, that can be so hard to rebuild. And I know there's some of you in the room who there has been sin done to you and you're living in the consequences of that. And I've seen so many fall into patterns over the years that have led them into a hole that is just very, very difficult to get out of. Especially when you think about if there's crime involved. It can be very hard. Even if they've been saved and redeemed and are living for Jesus, it can be very hard to get out of that hole. Here's some more hope for you today. If you are here today, there is so much hope, whether you are suffering as a direct consequence of your bad choices like David, or just because we are living in a broken world where bad things happen that we don't have any control over. We've got to understand this. This is the first principle. God is faithful to forgive, but sin has consequences. He's faithful to forgive, but sin has consequences consequences. I don't want us to forget that David has been forgiven. He has been restored. He gets to live. But these consequences, they are in motion. Now, when I think about sin at a, at a broad level and a personal level, there's a, because of sin, we have to, there's some things that happen. The first thing that, that happens is there's separation from God. Now, this is contrary to our design. We were not designed to be separate from God. We were designed to be with God. We, we see this right at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis. God creates the man and the woman to dwell with him in the garden, to experience life with him, to live with him. But then they are deceived by the serpent who we know to be Satan. They eat of the fruit. And sin, from that moment, enters the picture and it has been affecting everyone and everything ever since then. And there is separation from God in that moment. Romans 3.23 says this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Ephesians 2.1, you are dead in your trespasses and sins. At a fundamental, foundational level, sin cuts off our ability to be with God. We have to understand that. We have to understand that in order to have salvation. We have to understand that we are dead in our sin in need of God, and we need his grace. We need the cross. For believers in the room, I think it's very important for you to understand that there is no separation for you. You cannot be separated from the love of God. There's nothing that can pluck you out of his hand that can take you from him, but sin can get in the way. Sin can cause... And I use the word carefully to say separation, but it can make it feel like there's some separation there. There's a disconnect with him when sin has entered the picture. I was thinking about this. We just came through 21 days of prayer. And to be quite honest, it's a, it's a challenging time for our staff. It's just a grueling schedule for us. And it, it affects home as well. And Allison and I, kind of towards the last week, we just gotten out of sync and we weren't communicating like we should be. And there was just a lot of like kind of tension in the house. You know what I'm talking about. And it wasn't until we sat down on the back porch one morning and had a cup of coffee together and just kind of cleared the air and kind of worked through some things that we were able to kind of regain our, our connection. And I was still married to her that whole time, but there was a separation at play. It felt like God, we just weren't, weren't jiving. Separation for God. The second thing, our sin is never just affecting us. And this is where he loves, the enemy loves to get us. He loves to lie to us with this and, and say, no one will ever know. Just go ahead. This will just be us. This is gonna be a private matter. You just, nobody's gonna know. And meanwhile, you could be creating an addiction that could affect generations to come the choice could affect generations to come. You've heard the saying, your sins will find you out. Uh, that comes from Numbers 32, 23. It says, but if you don't do this, you will certainly sin against the Lord. Be sure your sin will catch up with you. And this is certainly the case for David. Nathan tells him that the sword is never going to leave his house. He's gonna lose the baby. This is not gonna be the only child that he loses. And chaos, conspiracy, and lies are going to run through David's kingdom for the rest of his life. 
Our sin is always affecting others. And the last thing that sin does is there's it, there is a debt that has to be paid. There's a debt that has to be paid. The penalty for sin is death. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. The sacrifice had to be made. The animal had to be sacrificed. Jesus had to die on the cross. And the consequences of sin are very, very real. And I think it's good to know that David should have died. He should have been killed for this crime, punished for this crime. And I'm sure he would have gladly died instead of his son. But God does it differently in this mysterious way, and he makes David feel the searing pain of losing a child. For believers in this room, I want you to know that the Lord allows us to feel consequences so that we don't continue down the sinful road again. Just to illustrate it in a little bit lighter way, I got a little bit of a struggle with anger. I don't know if you do. I don't know what your, maybe your daily struggle is. Mine can be anger. I'm easily frustrated. But usually when, it's, when I'm trying to fix something that I have no business trying to fix, or I'm like, um, you know, trying to put together, say, a simple child's toy, let's have a real direct way to my... Uh, button that pushes my frustration and anger. And usually what happens is I end up either breaking the thing that I'm trying to fix or putting together, which is a consequence for me and my children, or I like cut myself or injure myself somehow. The other night I was trying to put the girls to bed and they were not uh, doing that all that easily. And I walked out of that room, super frustrated, and knocked my knuckle on the door frame, and like it bled and was like horrible. And I was like, ah! And Allison was like, the Lord's speaking to you. <laughs> and I was like, I know. But I like had this little tiny cut that just reminded me for the next few weeks that of my anger and my frustration, how I'm quick-tempered. And it helped me, and I, and I mean, the Lord kind of used it, and that's what he's kind of doing here at a lar- larger level, to get me to see the consequences of my actions. Just a little reminder of what sin does. We find David here, and he's desperate, and David is being incredibly humbled at this moment. He's being brought very, very low, and we find him fasting and praying and pleading, which I, I do think is such a beautiful moment, because in the complication of this moment. Who does David run to? He runs to God. He turns to God. He knows he can go to God. He knows he can seek him. He knows he can cry out to him. He knows that he's still loved by God. David's eyes are being turned back to the Lord. You know, this doesn't make things hurt less, but but oftentimes God brings us through hard things just to get more of us, more of our heart. And I think it's important for you to know that as hard as this is to to grasp, there are levels that God wants to take us to in our relationship with him that we will only access through suffering and pain. Just some scripture to kind of bring this to life. Romans 5.3 says, and not only that, but we also boast in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance. James 1 says, consider it great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And then there's 1 Peter 5.10, which is the flagship verse for my family. It says, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you. I recently started running, and uh, about eight weeks ago, I was just like, you know what, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start running. I've been to visit my family, and my brother, he's running a marathon coming up, and kind of inspired me to like run, and then he showed me this awesome YouTube video, and then I was like, I gotta run. And so I put on my, my very poor quality shoes, and I went for a run, and I'm, I was just hoping to maybe make it a mile without stopping, which I did, 
But I'd like to show you a picture of, of me just moments after. I don't know if you can tell, but this is the face of a man who's about to die. And I thought, I better just grab a quick pic. And I sent it to my brother. Just wanted you to be able to remember me. This was right before I collapsed on the side of the road. But I'm thinking about endurance, right? I'm thinking about going through hard things and that building endurance. In that moment, I did not have a lot of endurance. But from that moment, that really hard moment, I've been building endurance since then. And each time I've gone out to run, I've gotten a little bit stronger and a little bit better. But then each new mile that I hit, it's, it's hard. I got to push to get there. And then there's this reward when it's done. It's just like, ah, we did it. We got through it. And I think that's the picture of fear that in suffering, in the trials, God is building in you endurance and in strength. And he's showing you more of who he is. And he's molding you into his image and that only comes through the trial, through walking through pain. He wants to strip us a lot of times that only, that, so that the only option we've got is to run to him, run to the Savior. Who, let me remind you today, has bore your grief and he has carried your sorrow. But we know that David's prayer is not answered. The baby does die, and David finds this, himself in this messy collision of a broken world meeting a broken man's choices. And he finds himself in the mystery of suffering in this life. And it's the second thing I want you to know. God is faithful even in the mystery. He's faithful even in the mystery. That's a true statement, but, let, but a lot of times we are left asking one question. And what is that question? Why? Why is this happening? Why are you allowing this to happen, God? I'm confused, God. Why, why, why? And if you're like me, you're reading this text and you're like, why did God have to kill the baby? Like, that doesn't seem fair. That seems cruel. Why did he, why did he have to do that? And listen, I don't have a good answer for you today. And none of the commentaries I read, they didn't have a good answer either. But there's this question of why that can can drive us to a place of just only further confusion. I, I hear it from my kids all the time. I don't know if you can relate to this, but I got a nine-year-old and a four-year-old who are professional question askers. That's all they do. They just, we gotta put, my nine-year-old, Hadley, she's like, we have to put her on these like breaks. I'm like, okay, no more questions. And then I'll hear like squirming in the back seat of the car. It always happens in the car. And I'm like, what's going on? She's like, well, I'm trying not to, I'm trying to ask this not in a question. I'm like, but Willa, my four-year-old, she's all the time wondering what, what's going on. We'll be driving down the road and we might see like a house being built. And she'd be like, what are they doing, dad? And I'm like, well, they're building a house. But why? And I'm like, because people need a place to live. But why? Uh, because lots of people are moving to Lebanon, Tennessee and they got to have more houses. But why? I don't know why. It's a dead-end street a lot of the times. Knowing why God took Finley Gray Hugs, I, I don't know, ultimately. They're, they're, that was my daughter that we lost. We knew a lot of answers. We got a lot of stuff from the doctors, but it didn't help. It didn't. There's still a lingering why. Why Josh Simmons had to pass away, I don't know. That, that, we didn't, you fill in the blank with your tragedy, with your question. But you... If, even if we knew why, you, knew what, you know what it wouldn't do? It doesn't make the pain go away. It doesn't heal the heart. David, I'm sure, is asking why. I'm sure he's struggling with this. You read the Psalms and we see his struggle. But David knows that why is a dead end. And I love that what David does here, he turns to prayer and fasting and asking God. David is focusing on the who. I think that this is so, so crucial. We will never understand the mysteries of God and why he allows bad things to happen to people. But the powerful truth for us today is to stop focusing so much on the why and choose to trust the one who loves you more than you could ever imagine, who is near you in your pain, who cares about your sorrow. Though complicated, God will take us to the end of ourselves so that we can truly see him 
for who he is and find out just how much he loves us. I love this quote from Warren Wiersbe. He's a commentator and theologian. He's got two great commentaries I'd recommend on the Old and New Testament. And this is what he says in regards to this very passage. And this just says it all so beautifully. There are no easy answers to settle our minds, but there are plenty of dependable promises to heal our hearts. And faith is nurtured on promises, not explanations. Faith is nurtured on promises, not explanations. There has to be a point where we choose to believe the promise, okay? Where the promise moves from head to heart. And the promise is this, that we are loved by God. He is gracious to us, even in the trial, even if we have brought it on ourselves, He is still gracious, he's still loving, and still wants us to take you deeper to a deeper understanding of who he is. And let me say this, if you're in the middle of it right now, if you're living in the consequences of your sin right now, your story is not over. Jesus has a plan for you, and his grace is enough for you. And if you're in the middle of a tragedy right now, and it is hard to see hope, His grace is enough for you and your story is not over. That's some good news for us. Y'all alive out there? Everybody okay? Okay. We're gonna shift to some better news. Is that all right with y'all? We're gonna look at David's response. He responds in an amazing way. Verse 20 says this, then David got up from the ground. I wanna remind you, he's been on the ground Weeping, sad, praying, fasting. No one can get him up. And he hears that the baby has died. And he gets up from the ground, and this is what he does. He washed, anointed himself, changed his clothes, went to the Lord's house, and worshiped. And then he went home and requested something to eat, so they served him food, and he ate. David lost his way, just like we lose our way. But you see, there was a lifeline that drew him back to the heart of God. And it was being in the presence of God. It was worship and prayer and fasting. See, spending time in the presence of God was a deep part of David's life. It was cultivated over years of time. And even in a situation as complicated as this, David remembered God is faithful and his presence is our guide. God is faithful and his presence is our guide. I want to illustrate this way. In older times, farmers in the Midwest, okay, when it was called the whiteout, in the winter when the blizzards would hit and the snow would hit, they still had work to be done. They still had to feed their animals. They still had to take care of the farm. And what they would do is they would tie a rope from the back door of their house all the way out to the barn. And they would clutch that rope as their guide and they would pull themselves through the snow and through the wind and through the howling sound. They couldn't see, but they would hold that rope and they knew that rope was gonna take them to the barn so they could take care of their animals. And then that rope would take them back home. There is, I want you to understand, there's a compound effect that happens in us when we cultivate the presence of God in our lives. Years of being in the word, spending time in his presence by cultivating the relationship. My friends, when the bottom drops out in your life, you're gonna have something to hold on to. You're gonna have something to grasp. And better yet, you're gonna realize that he's the one holding on to you. And he's been there all along, ready to guide you right back home. We talk about this a lot, of spending time with God, reading your Bible, praying, journaling. I mean, it's probably the most repeated thing here, other than Jesus died for our sins. But I don't want you to fall into the trap of thinking this is just a checklist that we want you to do. 
This is so much more than a checklist. This is communing with God. This is being with God. This is interacting with God. We are spending time in his presence. Reading your Bible doesn't get you to God. He is already here. He's already with you. And we are interacting with him. And when we put ourselves in a posture to hear from him, to open the word, to pray, to worship, we're putting ourselves in a posture to hear from him, and when all we're doing when we're doing that is we're just tying off rope. We're tying off security, something to hold on to that's gonna pull us back when the hard times come. We are interacting with him. And some of you are like, well, I don't feel him a lot of times. I don't feel God. And I think sometimes God takes us through sort of dry periods where we might not be hearing like as fresh as we once were. But I'm reminded of Isaiah. He says, those who wait on the Lord renew their strength. But a lot of times when I hear this question, I, and I start asking questions back, we're like, okay, well, tell me what you're doing in the Word. Like, are you reading the Bible? Are you spending any time in Scripture? Are you praying? And they're like, well, no, not really. How can we expect to hear from God if we are never being with Him? Consistency is key here. And that's where I think a daily habit has to be built. It has to be cultivated. You know, just like in running, I'm eight weeks in, and it's just been mile by mile, little by little, of getting up and going out for a run. And over time, that consistency is building. And now I'm kind of become some crazy person where I'm like, I can't wait to go for a run. The same is true with the word. And I just want to encourage you to, sometimes we put so much pressure on ourselves that we got to have a quiet time. Just start with one day. Just read your Bible and pray for one day a week and see what God will do in your life. And what's gonna happen is he's gonna start building a habit in you and you're gonna start wanting to do two days and three days and four days and five days. And then you might even be having quiet times on Sunday. Be reading your Bible and coming to church. You'll really be in business then. But it's that consistency that builds the relationship. It's about learning to be with God. My final thought for us today is this. God is faithful and heaven is our home. God is faithful and heaven is our home. Verse 21, his servants asked him, why have you done this? While the baby was alive, you fasted and wept, but when he died, you got up and ate food. And he answered, while the baby was alive, this is David talking, I fasted and wept because I thought, who knows, the Lord may be gracious to me and let him live. But now that he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? And don't miss this last line. I'll go to him, but he will never return to me. I will go to him, but he will never return to me. Death is the end here on earth. And David knew that. David knew there was no coming back from this moment. But David knew a couple of very important things. One, he knew where he was going. And secondly, he knew where his baby was. And his baby was with the Lord. And I just want to stop and say just a word of encouragement to moms and dads in the rooms who have faced miscarriages, either past, present, or maybe you will. I believe your baby is in the arms of Jesus. And I believe that this verse gives a little light and a little hope for us that when children die who cannot make an active choice to trust Jesus, God in his grace keeps them. He has them and they are with him in his presence. And I believe that's true for believers who have passed away. If you have lost someone in your life who is a believer in Jesus, they are with the Lord and you will see them again. You will go to them. They will not return to you. You will go to them. You know, one of the promises that we saw or the way we like to phrase it in my house, it's this January will be 11 years since we lost Finley. I'm not 11 years from her. I'm 11 years closer to her. And every day that passes, you are closer to that reunion, you are closer to heaven. And that's a beautiful truth to end this complicated story, this tragic story. There is a hope for heaven. There is a hope that we have in his presence. 
And as I close, I love this because for me, this text really proves that David has, is a man after God's own heart. I mean, he really is. To experience such tragedy, to such sadness, such suffering, and to still turn to God, to still know that he can count on God, to still trust God in this moment. That's the kind of person that I wanna be. It's the kind of person that I want you to be. It's the kind of person that I want our church to be. That when, when the storm comes, when the chaos is caving in, we are firmly planted in the promise of God, in the truth of his word, in the promise of who he is. And this is what makes this all true because hundreds of years later from this moment in David's life, there's gonna be a baby that's born. Not of sin, but of a miracle. And the baby is gonna to grow to be a man and he's gonna live a sinless life and he's gonna show us that he was God, that he's the rightful king of Israel, not just for Israel, but for all mankind. And he's gonna to go to a cross and he's gonna die for the sins of humanity. But death's not gonna be his end. Death is going to be his beginning and he's gonna defeat death and he's gonna rise from the grave and our Jesus is reigning victorious right now with us. And just like David, he picks us up from the ground. He breathes life back into us. He changes our clothes. He's anointed us with the power of the Holy Spirit and he's invited us in for a feast with him in his house and in his kingdom. This is our God. And I want you to know today, God is for you. He is not against you. And though he allows death, God is not death. He is life. He is the life giver. And he's ready to breathe life in you today. And that's the hope we have. That's the promise we have. That's what we're standing on today. Amen. Let's pray. God, we love you.